first talk will be given by Edgar Castro on the estimation of distances using graph distance. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so in case you wonder, uh, midway, uh, my talk has not much to do with robustness uh, and some with uh, high dimensional statistics. But let me start with, uh, at the very basic, where it's not even clear there's a high dimensional issue at all. And uh, before I go on, uh, let me say that uh, those are uh, my collaborators on uh, some of those projects that I'm going to present today. And I'm going to start with uh, Euclid and the matrix, uh, distance matrix completion. Uh, so the problem goes as follows. If you have an under underrated graph uh, G with the vertex set V and in the uh, edge set E, you can assume uh, V is going to be finite and it can be 1 to N without loss of generality. Delta IJ is going to denote the dissimilarity between uh, nodes I and J. And it's only available uh, as usual when uh, I and J form an edge uh, in the graph. Okay. So um, the <coughs> we say that uh, D uh, with coefficients Dij is a Euclidean distance matrix. If there are, there's a configuration of points in some Euclidean space uh, such that uh, Dij is equal to the norm, uh, so the Euclidean distance between uh, Yi and Yj. Okay. And we only require actually, uh, okay, this is fine. Okay. And so the problem, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, from some, generally speaking, uh, of uh, completing, so you can distance uh, metric completion is following. You're given a uh, weight graph, which actually dictates uh, what uh, distances are available to you through uh, the edge set E. And then the problem is to find a Euclidean distance matrix D such that uh, its coefficients, this should be possible D to be consistent with what I have here. Uh, close to the, so wherever you're observing, you want the matrix to, to have, uh, to be close to that, okay? So for example, this could be formalized as, say, uh, an optimization problem where you try to solve, say, the error sum, minimize the error sum of squares, of course, over uh, what you observe. This is just one possible formulation. Okay? The rephrasing of this problem is in terms of graph embedding, so, um, Instead of uh, talking about uh, distance matrices, we can talk about configuration of po configurations of points. And uh, the problem is as follows. You're also <coughs> given a uh, weighted graph. And uh, this time, you might want to also be given a uh, uh, desired embedding dimension D. And the problem becomes to find a configuration of points in uh, that Euclidean space uh, such that their pairwise Euclidean distances are close to uh, the, uh, the similarities, again, over the ones that are given to you. Okay? And one way to formalize this, which is exactly the same, <coughs> same way I had in, in, in the previous slide, is through a, uh, say, square error, as this here. And actually, this has a name in statistics called uh, no matrix scaling, although uh, when, uh, it's also of interest to do that when. Uh, uh, when the minimization is over all possible pairs, meaning uh, that would be a case of a complete graph. So this has a bunch of, so the problem itself, this is more like a methodology here. Uh, the problem itself is known under various names, uh, multidimensional scaling, graph drawing, graph embedding, I, I already used that one. Euclidean distance matrix completion, I already used that one, and also graph realization and sensor localization. There are important connections, uh, non-trivial ones, with the nearest neighbor's search, which uh, there's a large literature on the topic. There's the last workshop in this program is actually on nearest neighbor search in a few weeks from now. And there's also a non-trivial connection to an area of uh, mathematics called, uh, you know, like, which, which revolves around embedding uh, finite metric spaces into more general Banach spaces. This is what I'm talking about now is relatively really, uh, elementary compared to um, much more sophisticated mathematics that go into this in particular. So it's not at that level of complexity, but um, there's a, a non-trivial relationship with the literature. Okay. 
So when the graph is complete and um, the, uh, the similarities are, uh, so when, when we say that the graph is realizable, meaning there is really a configuration of points that, uh, for which the, uh, the similarities are the pairwise Euclidean distances, then the problem can be solved exactly uh, via an eigenvalue problem. And has, this has been known for a long time. And uh, the algorithm is uh, known under the name of classical scaling. I'm sure there are other names for it. So you don't care about the dimension into which you embed it? Could so, just any Banach space? No, no, so I'm just restricting myself to Euclidean spaces for this. So I was just drawing a connection with Banach spaces, but uh, I won't talk about more than that. Than that. And for this one, you can actually figure out what the uh, minimum dimension is for exact embedding by looking at uh, the, essentially the spectrum of uh, an appropriate matrix. Yeah. So you don't have to be provided with that, but in practice you are provided with that and you just uh, embed in the, the dimension with possibly some error. That's typically what happens in practice. Okay. <coughs> so uh, recently, actually, I wanted to plug this in uh, with Adele, who mm -hmm. might be in the audience here, also participating in the, uh, in the program. We finished a paper on uh, showing that classical scaling is robust to noise and with implications to, uh, for manifold learning. It's somewhat connected to the <coughs> shock, although not passed directly, but it's worth mentioning. Um, OK, so that's the case for uh, when the graph is complete. All the similarities are uh, available. Uh, and the more general case where some dissimilarities might be missing is much more complicated. Uh, in fact, there is an area of, uh, it's an area, an area of math that's actually dedicated to uh, questions such as uh, when is the graph uh, realizable now that all the dissimilarities may not be available. And you'll find this in the, the name of rigidity theory. Um. Okay, so for this particular case, again, now it's the general case where some of the dissimilarities may be missing. A number of uh, actual algorithms beyond uh, answering the question yes, no, is the graph realizable? Uh, actual methods have been suggested for embedding the graph and trying to realize it. So one of them, the one I'm going to talk about today more, is based on uh, using graph distances um, to uh, fill in the, uh, the matrix of the similarities. Uh, another one, so the, all of those have been known for quite a while. So this one in particular, uh, I'm going to say a bit more about it in, in the, uh, shortly. Uh, it's the one that underlies uh, ISOMAP, the uh, famous method for mindful learning. Uh, but in fact, it was first suggested uh, at least uh, as early as 1980 as a method for uh, Euclidean distance matrix completion. Or uh, let me call it graph drawing. Okay. So that's one uh, class of methods. Uh, another one is based on, so this one, I really only know two papers that really suggest this, but it's very natural, is you start by embedding a clique. A clique is a, co a complete subgraph, so you can use classical scaling for that. And then uh, you embed all the other points that, are, uh, that you can by essentially what we call triangulation or trial iteration. And you continue like that. Okay? So you grow the graph and you can show it's very, very straightforward. But it's a nice idea that you can uh, make that work. Uh, but it's, pretty non it's not robust to noise that much. Okay? Okay, another, another class of techniques. Uh, so this can be generalized, but uh, one um, goes as follows. You embed everything you can embed. So in particular, let's say you embed all possible clicks. So all the clicks in graphs. So it might not be computational feasible, but uh, let's put that aside. You embed all the clicks. And for this, you can use classical scaling. And then you try to, uh, it's as if all the clicks now are embedded as point sets, but in the Euclidean space of same dimension, as if they live in, in a parallel universes. So now you have to put them together so that you have, they actually live together in a coherent embedding of all the point sets. Oh, oh, sorry, of the whole uh, graph, sorry. Okay. All right, so then there's also a direct optimization by grand descent and other methods. Actually, this is not the only approach. And there's another one which consists in uh, relaxing the problem into a semi-definite program. Uh, and it's also a large class of, uh, of methods, uh, including uh, Adele and, and uh, Andrea's work uh, on the topic. OK, so I'm going to focus on graph distances and what can we do with them. So this is uh, the case of uh, sensor network localization, which is typically understood as being the case where uh, Nodes in the graph are connected if the underlying Euclidean distances assuming the graph is realizable. 
uh, are uh, below a certain threshold. Okay? So you observe the shortest distances and you don't observe the other ones. Okay? So uh, there we go. So an edge here between two points. So the nodes are points. Of course, we don't have access to this picture. All we have is the weight matrix, which is incomplete. And uh, an edge between two points indicates that the Euclidean distance is available. And I'm assuming it's visible here. Okay. okay. So imagine that uh, um, I want to uh, um, sorry, estimate the distance between those two points here in the red squares. So it's not directly available, right? The distance between here and here is not directly available. There's no edge between those two points in the graph. But what I do is I simply compute the shortest path distance and uh, record its length. Uh, and that's what I, I use as proxy for, for that uh, Euclidean distance between the two, the two, those two points. So I'm, I'm using the length of the red uh, polygonal line here as an estimate, and as an estimate for uh, the length of the uh, purple line. Okay. So uh, everybody knows that in this audience, but uh, this is how you define a graph distance. So remember, we are given the similarities between nodes, uh, some of the nodes, sorry, some of the pairs of nodes. And, uh, but you can compute, in principle, the distance between uh, any pairs of nodes by uh, looking at the infimum of all, possible, all, all paths that connect the two nodes. And you, for each path, you look at its length. Uh, it's really the sum of the weights along that path. And you take the infimum of all paths such, uh, as such. Okay. Okay, so uh, what kind of guarantees can we get for uh, graph distances in terms of estimates seen as estimates for the underlying uh, Euclidean distances? Uh, so I'm going to place myself in the context of a neighborhood graph as I showed you uh, in the picture. So only the uh, shortest distances are available more precisely if xi and xj are within. So the x's represent the underlying true positions, let's say. And uh, if uh, that Euclidean distance between xi and xj is less than or equal to r, then I'm observing the dissimilarity between uh, the corresponding nodes in the graph, i and j. And I'm given, I'm actually given that distance. Okay? And this is a sort of result that uh, you can get. This is relatively simple to get, but it was uh, new as far as, I'm, as we know. Uh, so if uh, we have a point set as such here, and we uh, define this quantity. So this, is, this quantifies how dense the point cloud is inside its convex set. Uh, so it's a convex hull. Okay. Then uh, if epsilon here, which again uh, quantifies the density of the points inside the convex hull, is small compared to the radius of connectivity, then uh, we have this bound. So uh, the Euclidean distance, of course, is the shortest one. So it's uh, Euclidean geometry. <laughs> so this is bound, of course, by the, uh, sh the length of the shortest path, so the graph distance between i and j in the graph, no question about that. But then the upper bound um, is non trivial, and you have this error rate. So it's in epsilon over r squared. Okay. So it was known before, I'm going to talk about it in a second, uh, it was without a square, but this, this whole thing, uh, the proof is one page, it's not uh, in completely elementary. So so yeah, the result was known before again uh, here without a square, so a bit uh, not as precise, I guess. But this is for the Euclidean case, and uh, what it derived was for a surface. I'll say a bit more in a second, and this was, this was in the context of, uh, of proving that isomap did something uh, reasonable. And isomap, for those that don't know, is one of the main methods, so well-known methods, I don't know if it's most popularly used in practice. But it's one of the best known methods for manifold learning. And the connection between manifold learning and then uh, graph embedding is the following. In manifold learning, you're not given the pairwise dissimilarities, you're actually given points, but in high dimension. Okay? And you assume the points are an on or near a lower dimensional uh, submanifold. And the distances of interest, at least when they are long ones, are not the Euclidean distances, they are the geodesic distances on the surface. Okay, because those are the ones you want to actually infer to be able to then uh, find a chart for the manifold and an appropriate embedding of the points in lower dimensional uh, Euclidean space this time. Okay. 
So, uh, so you don't trust the longest distances. So if it's, you know, if you have uh, two points that are, of course you have the distance because you have the points, but if, if they are far away, don't trust that this is an accurate uh, estimate for the corresponding geodesic distance, which is the case if there's some curvature in the surface. But you do trust the shortest distances because uh, locally, uh, some manifold is uh, more or less Euclidean, okay? So it's as if you can approach the manifold learning uh, problem by essentially uh, looking at completing the Euclidean matrix, uh, sorry, the uh, distance matrix, where you actually erase, uh, you compute all the pairwise distances, Euclidean ones, but you essentially remove all the long ones and then try to complete it. Okay. And uh, if you complete it by using graph distances, that's exactly what isomap does. So I'll come back to that. Uh, so what we did uh, in the paper with uh, Thibault Le Guic is, uh, so we actually revisited this and connected with some results by Dubin's uh, in robotics in the 50s and uh, so that we, can get, we could get to see the result as Bernstein and, and, and others uh, got in 2000 for Isomap. And then we extended this to constraint paths where we constrain the cur their curvature. So uh, here's the setting. So uh, this is what I just said. Like manifold learning, the distances of interest are not the Euclidean distances, but the intrinsic distances on the underlying surface. Okay, and the same is true actually in also in, uh, in motion planning, where uh, you know if you're in the domain and you have some obstacles, and you want you know by definition you don't want to go through the obstacle, so you have to go around, and therefore what you're interested in is the paths that are uh, intrinsic to the domain, and not the Euclidean paths. Okay. There's, a, there's very large literature on motion planning. Um, that's, mm, it is, a, it is a, in a sense, uh, can be seen as a, a case of this. Okay, so, <coughs> so, so our target now is going to be to estimate the shortest path and shortest path distances on a surface. Um, so in general, if you have a subset uh, of a Euclidean space, everything is going to be in a finite uh, dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, you can define the intrinsic distance that uh, essentially it inherits from the ambient uh, space uh, as being uh, the length of the shortest uh, one lips well, curve, I guess, um, continuous curve that belongs to the set that's important and that links the two points of interest. Okay. We're going to call it G. So G of XI, X, G of X, X prime is the intrinsic distance on S between X and X prime. Okay, so our, at our disposal, we have a sample uh, IID from, uh, from S. It's actually not IID. It can be IID, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, this is just a habit. <laughs> um, so just a sample of size N from S. Um, as you see, our results are non-probabilistic. And we just assume that like, it's compact and connected. And then the goal is to estimate uh, G of X, I, X, J for all pairs. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to form, so here we're given the, the points, so we do as in manifold learning, uh, what isomap does in fact. We're going to form the uh, neighborhood graph uh, with connectivity radius little r, and then now delta of x, x prime is going to denote the uh, graph distance between x and x prime in that graph. Now this epsilon plays the same role as it did before, it's defined a bit differently now, so uh, it's essentially quantifies how dense this sample is in S. Okay, so you take any point X in S, and you look at the minimum distance to one of the sample points, you maximize that over all points in S, and you get epsilon. Okay, okay. so um, this was all, so this result here, this upper bound, which is the same as before, but we had to square, and now it's on the surface, so this, this is more general, before it was in the Euclidean case. Um, but it's, it's essentially, essentially has the same flavor, so the, uh, the, the other bound here is always true, but, um, sorry, that's not true now, but sorry, no, no. So, uh, so first this upper bound, which is relatively easy to get, uh, you get uh, that the uh, graph distance between x, x and x prime is bounded by, well, the uh, geodesic distance between x and x prime, so, uh, sometimes called geodesic, it's a bit of a misnomer, but um, on s, uh, times a factor essentially one plus uh, an error in epsilon over r. Okay, so this was known and was derived uh, uh, by the people that designed the ASO map uh, a while back. Um, okay, 
And so for an upper bound, we need a f uh, some additional um, conditions on S, so some very weak assumptions here, and then uh, that uh, this is the main one, uh, that the shortest paths on, on S have curvature at most kappa. So it really is their result. We, revisit, we revisited the result and uh, showed that it could, could be derived from uh, much older results uh, in, the, in the robotics literature. That was kind of our contribution here. Um, that uh, there is a, a, a quantity that depends on the underlying surface that can be essentially uh, tied to uh, the so-called reach of that surface. Um, and so if the surface is a manifold without boundary, then uh, no, it doesn't simplify things. Okay, I can say a bit more offline, but anyway, it's not super complicated. I just don't want to define now. And um, okay, and then so if uh, the radius of connectivity is below this feature, geometric feature of S, and uh, it's also just uh, small compared to uh, one over the curvature. One over the curvature is the maximum uh, radius of turning radius, or the minimum turning radius of, uh, of um, no. maximum turning radius. Let me see. Minimum turning radius of a, of a short path on S. So radius of connectivity is the minimum R such that the R neighborhood varies. Yeah. Connected. Yes. So, but this is, uh, so one over kappa is uh, the radius, the, the smallest radius, turning radius of a curve on S. Sorry. Right. So then we have this upper bound. So before we had the lower bound. So uh, the graph distance is here and the intrinsic distance is on the right hand side. And here is reversed. So the uh, intrinsic distance on the left hand side and then the uh, graph distance on the uh, right hand side. And before uh, this was trivial in the Euclidean case, so meaning that so this was the inequality in the Euclidean case. And here, uh, because of the curvature, uh, it's not trivial anymore. There's uh, an error of order r squared here. And I think I'm missing a kappa. I think it should be, okay. I might be missing something here. Sorry. No. I said like a C0 was universal, but I think it might be a kappa r squared. I might, okay. assume that kappa r is less than, is bounded, so maybe. Yeah, I thought there's something there. But. So the main contribution there, um, yeah, so we also show that uh, not only that, but actually, so this is approximating the distances, but you can also approximate the actual paths. So uh, shortest path in the graphs correspond to shortest paths on the surface. So we also add that. And the main focus in the paper is on curvature constrained uh, shortest paths and their distances. So uh, this can be seen as a regularization of just shortest paths, which come with no constraint really. So this one, uh, so let's define first the continuous quantity, which is the kappa curvature constraint intrinsic semi-distance on S. So if you have x and x prime on S, you look at the shortest curve between x and x prime on the surface, but that has curvature pointwise bounded by kappa. Okay. So same as before, but you add the constraint that the curve cannot have corners in particular, but cannot curve too much. And our hope is to do the same. So we, what we did in, uh, so, so far is that we, we approximated the uh, shortest paths on the surface with the uh, shortest paths on the graph, which are embedded as polygonal lines, okay? And we, all, we will want to do the same thing here. So uh, what we need is a notion of curvature for polygonal, polygonal lines, okay? So this is the one we uh, worked with. So uh, let me just explain. So if you have, so this is a piece of curvature uh, of a poly polygonal line, which is going to be an example of a path that you're going to use to approximate a continuous curve. So a, um, sorry, a shortest path on S. Uh, one in the graph is going to look like this once it's embedded. So you want to uh, define a curvature, in particular at the apexes, right? So let's say this one in the middle. How do you define the curvature there? So you look at the uh, neighboring uh, uh, corners, I guess, or apexes, vertices. And, and then you look, uh, so these three points uh, define a, a circle that goes through them. And then uh, you look at the inverse, you take the inverse of uh, the radius of that circle, and that's the curvature at that point. Okay. Are, are those points in the, in the same plane? Uh, always, right? So when you have three points, they define a plane. 
but, but the uh, but the polygonal line may not be the whole thing no but you only look at uh, triplets of points okay so there, there are other notions of discrete curvature this was kind of new to us but there are other notions of curvature in the, in the literature apparently but they are mostly based on angle which is not something that uh, we can use but this one we can use in particular has this nice consistency uh, result that says that uh, if you have a curve that's a uh, continuous curve that has even not just continuous smooth curve that's uh, twice differentiable then if you fix a point on the curve and approach it on both sides and, and, each, and you, you track the, uh, the curvature defined by the triangle there then it converges to the uh, curvature of that curve at that point okay, so it has that nice it's sort of the minimum you, can, you, you want of something like this this is quite elementary to prove but you know, we wanted this so uh, this has it and this was much harder to prove, but uh, we, uh, somehow we managed. It's not a very long proof, but it was somehow very... Anyway, so if, in fact, you have something a bit stronger. So this, uh, this one is sort of asymptotic, and we, but we needed something like this for our main result, which I'm going to uh, present in uh, two minutes. So this one says that, uh, so same setting, you have a curve, a uh, simple curve with a finite curvature, in fact, bounded by kappa point-wise. And if you take three points on the curve, the so same setting, the point in the middle is y. If the, the extreme points are close enough to each other, because they're far apart, anything goes, right? Because then the curve can do other things. Even if it doesn't self-intersect, it can be weird, right? And when they're close, then uh, it's, you know, this just a number that depends on kappa. It doesn't go to zero, as opposed to the other one. Uh, then the curvature at y, defined by x and z around it, uh, is bound by kappa. So it's cute on its own, but in fact, it was crucial to prove our main result. And this one uh, was non trivial, at least for us. <coughs> okay, so for technical reasons, we worked with an anonymous graph where instead of, so the, uh, the uh, graph typically is defined, well, the one I defined before was uh, the R ball neighborhood graph. So you connect two points if they are within distance R. But here, we, we actually remove some sort of, we do some sort of regularization when we remove uh, the, uh, the inner ball of radius r over 4. So we don't connect points if they are at a distance r over 4 or closer. Okay, so it's as if you take the r ball uh, neighborhood graph and regularize it by removing the very short edges. Okay. Okay, and now, uh, okay, so now, now that we define the notion of uh, curvature for polygonal lines, we can talk about the length of the shortest paths in the graph now with curvature bound by kappa, and that's what we do. So now uh, there's an upper bound and lower bound. So the upper bound on the graph distance is, is essentially the same as before. Okay, this was a four here as opposed to a six, but the only difference, and there's also con a constraint on epsilon over r, and, and there was no constraint on the type for before, but uh, uh, this was for the upper bound, of the, other, the other bound, but now there is one. So. Same as before, a constraint on epsilon over r. Epsilon again is the it quantifies how dense the sample is on the surface. R is the radius of connectivity. So uh, epsilon over r has to be small. Kappa, which is this uh, constraint on uh, on on the curves, the shortest curves on S, um, it has to be small. So r has to be small compared to one over kappa. And oh, I messed this up. Sorry. So. The, this should be, so which one is kappa prime? Yeah. This should be kappa prime. Sorry about that. So if you increase kappa a little bit, so you have kappa plus something that's going to be small if those conditions are satisfied. Okay, so kappa, kappa prime is kappa plus something small. Then the graph distance is constrained with, uh, uh, with curvature being at, at most kappa prime are bounded as, uh, by the corresponding distances on S but constrained to have curvature at most kappa. Okay. So we have to increase kappa a little bit to satisfy a, a similar uh, inequality. So how does it compare to, to the result for kappa on both sides? Uh, that we don't have, yeah. So we, have, uh, we need a little bit of leeway. Yeah. So the hard result was uh, for us, the, the other one, so, uh, yeah, 
the, you know, under some, some relatively mild conditions, uh, if you're willing to assume that the underlying set is a submanifold, then uh, uh, C2 submanifold, then uh, it's true that there's a number of kappa such that the shortest paths are have curvature at most kappa. That's what I'm saying here. There are actually uh, subtleties when the, uh, the set is a submanifold, but with the boundary, then there are some things that are actually non trivial. So. <coughs> And it wasn't our work, but we looked at the literature, and actually the, the, case, the, the setting is actually surprisingly complicated. But anyway, so uh, here's the corresponding upper bound. This, uh, this, was, uh, this, this is the main result in, in that particular paper. Uh, it was non trivial for us. So we have essentially a, a matching upper bound in a strong sense, in that the unconstrained paths in, the, in that analysis graph, okay, that are shortest between two you know, uh, endpoints. We actually show that they uh, already, without constraint, then actually by themselves satisfy a uh, constraint or curvature. Okay. So the the unconstrained shortest paths in the analysis graph satisfy a constraint of curvature that's actually close to the uh, curvature uh, on the continuous side of things. So close to the kappa that uh, that bounds the curvature of uh, you know shortest paths on the surface. And that's what it says. So if, again, r is small and then epsilon over r squared now is small, so a bit of a stronger assumption, then the source paths on the graph without constraint them actually already have a constraint on the curvature, satisfy constraint curvature. And the curvature is a mode kappa prime, where kappa prime is something like kappa plus something small. <coughs> actually, it's even stronger, like we want epsilon over r cubed to be small even. So the, const the constraints are uh, stronger, but we have uh, uh, in exchange we have a strong upper bound in that way. So that's, I have only five minutes for the remaining, but uh, I'll try to make sense of the problem and then, uh, at least motivate you enough to go see the paper if you want. <laughs> okay. So this one is uh, still on estimating Euclidean distances, but now based on an adjacency matrix. So you have, you still have the connectivity information, but we don't have the weights on the edges. That's gone now. Okay. And it goes as follows. Uh, this has, we're not the first ones to consider this. There's some literature on the topic. Uh, I'll, say, I'll, I'll, I'll give some pointers uh, in the next slide. But here's uh, the setting. So you have an adjacency matrix, but this I really mean uh, the weights are either zero or one. Okay, one if there's an edge and zero otherwise. Okay, and uh, we still assume that the graph to be undirected. We as we presuppose the existence of a configuration of points in some Euclidean space. I changed the dimension to be v here for some reason, but um, and now the the priority that you see an edge between uh, i and j is a function of the distance between x i and x j. Okay, the x's are unknown. We only have the adjacency matrix, no weights. In fact, we also assume that the link function is unknown. But the goal is the same. We still want to uh, estimate the Euclidean distances between the underlying points, and they are sometimes called latent positions. OK, so there's, there's a relatively uh, well-known paper in the area. Um, and uh, there's more work by uh, Carrie Priby and his group, and then Ulrike von Lusberg and, and her group. Uh, I'll, I don't have time to mention, anyway. Um, okay. <coughs> and um, so, you know, maybe uh, surprisingly, like, actually, you can do something, but you can do something. There are some restrictions, but you can do quite a bit. So, our estimator is still based on, so our goal again is to estimate the, uh, the distance between the, um, the latent positions. And uh, our estimate is still based on the uh, graph distances. I'm going to call them, as I did before, delta. Delta ij is the graph distance between i and j. But now the weights are either 0 or 1, right? So essentially, the, the distance here between i and j is the number of links it takes to join i and j in this graph. And OK. So if this link function is uh, this one here, so it's uh, one if uh, be, you know below r and zero otherwise, then we just put an r in front. Okay. Now if r, I say like phi could be unknown, right? But so imagine that uh, phi is really on the, of this form, but r is unknown. Well, it's it's gone forever. So I just uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna estimate up to a scaling. Okay. So so in a sense I can assume that. Thank you. 
in a sense, I can assume that uh, R is, uh, is known because of that. Okay. Because if it's unknown, essentially, I have a choice of the best R. And the result is up to scaling, which is lost forever. Okay, so that's uh, our estimate is still uh, the our, uh, the set of uh, uh, graph distances scaled, and we get a similar band as we had before. It's also pretty short proof under similar conditions, very similar proof, very similar arguments, and in fact there's a matching lower bound, uh, so it's essentially the best you can hope for at least under in sort of a minimax sense. So. Uh, it's possible in general, maybe a bit better, but uh, at least in the worst case sense, that's the best you can hope for. So this is for the case where uh, phi is this. Okay, I think I'm going to have time to state the the main result. But here's uh, some very simple numerics. Those are the actual latent positions. This, those are recovered with this particular R, recovered with this particular R, recovered with this particular R. So you can do, you know, using what I just said now. So you, you complete the, dis the uh, distance matrix and then apply classical scaling. That's essentially what uh, isomap does. And, uh, and we recover uh, the points. So it's just a proof of concept. Now the method, uh, if you saw the, the, uh, the condition, the central one was that the points are dense in their convex hull, right? So the, the method requires convexity, and in fact, if those are the latent positions, this is what you recover. So same, same uh, limitations as isomap, of course. So we're not doing quite isomap because here we don't have the weights, right? But, uh, okay. Now here's a more general case that we have in our paper, uh, and then we have something else also, but so now uh, phi is unknown for us, but we do assume something. So it goes, it becomes zero at R, but before that, so it has some sort of decay towards zero at R. This is dictated by alpha. So alpha equals zero, if there's a jump discontinuity at R, and then we are almost the same setting as before, not quite. And we're able to recover the points, uh, sorry, the distances, uh, but now there's a rate that depends on, uh, on alpha as well here. And we can extend this to a particular setting that's of, that was of particular interest to uh, Ulrike von Luxburg, who, who was, was the main person in recent years to push those problems. And we also, so we looked at the situation where the adjacency matrix is not uh, on the R-ball graph on the underlying point set, but on a k-nearest neighbor graph. And the situation is a bit different, at the same time is also similar, but, and we're able, to, we're able to deal with that. This is what this whole thing happens then. Like this, those are the latent positions. And uh, when you recover things, you see there's something odd that happens, right? And the reason is that uh, the edges form some form like, as if like a high speed free, uh, freeway. So the, uh, this is for the uh, K-nearest neighbor graph. And so between two points that are towards the middle of the rectangle, things are okay. But if the points are far away from each other, then it pays off to actually go on the boundary. I don't have time to explain why, but come ask me. Uh, it's not hard to figure out, actually. But. All right, so there's more in the related papers, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Um, so how important is the sampling condition on, on how dense to be? Uh, um, like I'm guessing, I, um, you may have specified this, but there, there must be something about uh, for, for any R ball, you have sufficient number of points. Yeah, so, okay. so you remember those conditions, the epsilon over R being small? That's exactly, that's the condition of being dense in each ball of radius R. So all the results, perhaps, you, I don't know if you saw it or not, but all the, all, all the results essentially had epsilon over r being right. small. Right. And that's ex essentially what you are, I think, what you're describing to me now. Uh, okay, great. Right. Epsilon being the density of the points, and then r is the you know, radius of the ball, so inside. Uh, so it's assume that it's, it's a uniform density. Because of, yeah. The rate controlled by epsilon. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And epsilon over r has to be small. Yeah. So in your uh, formula, the dimension of the embedded is density than enter, right? In, the, in your theorem, your... Uh, and in, and in which one? You, you uh, 
the longest path, the curvature was bounded, right? So the dimension of the embedded space just does, didn't enter in that book. No, no, the, uh, the, um, the ambient space? Yeah. No. I mean, the, the, the because there's, there's no the noise embedded, here. The, the dimension that you're embedding your, your graph. Ah, okay, for the... Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but in, in the second part, when we look at the curvature constraint paths, paths? Yeah. Okay, so there I didn't talk really necessarily on, on using that for embedding, you can, but uh, I was just like, est let's just estimate those distances. And there, the only, the main assumption is that on the surface, the curves have curvature at most kappa. The shortest curves have uh, curvature at most kappa. That's what I'm trying to understand intuitively. Why didn't the, the dimension seems like it has to matter, right? Because if you, if you embed in a very high dimension, I expect to have lower curvature. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, I, I don't know, I'm probably wrong. I'm not sure about the curvature part, but what does enter into account, uh, what answers the equation that has to do with the, uh, the intrinsic dimension is the density of the points. So we assume that uh, if the points are dense enough, and this can only be achieved really realistically if, uh, if, the, if uh, the, 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 the surface is of low intrinsic dimension. Yeah, the ambient dimension doesn't come into yeah, play. Of course. But I, I meant the intrinsic dimension, actually. The dimension, yeah. so it enters through the density, how dense the graph is. Yeah, yeah. What? Where do you see the fact that you need the number of samples exponential in the intrinsic dimension or something? Yeah, so, so it's in the, in the epsilon. So epsilon, like when you do like the usual proistic bounds, right, epsilon is going to be of the order of... Uh, log n over n to the power 1 over d, where uh, it's a little d, like the dimension of the uh, underlying surface. Yeah, there's no escaping that, yeah. Uh, is the so embedding that you get by solving the EDM very different from the embedding that you get from isomap? No, isomap is a way of uh, solving EDM. So the, you input, the, the, the distance that you're missing, you just input for them, uh, like, uh, use the graph distances. That's isomap. Well, the, uh, that part of isomap. And the second part of isomap is just you, do, uh, you, you apply classical scaling to get an embedding. But I'm thinking of the embedding where you take the, basically you embed where the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian form by the metric distances. So we that, that's that's uh, Laplace and eigenmaps, I think, so that you have in mind. the same as this embedding? I'm just saying, are there two different embeddings? I think what you describe now is the Laplace and eigenmaps. And is that different from the EDM embedding? Will it produce the different embedding? They don't solve that problem di directly. Yeah, Isomap does, but the uh, question again is they don't directly solve the uh, EDM problem. We can talk about more offline there. Okay, if there is no other question, we can. Thank you.